And good evening. I'm Dr. Coffee Brown for Interesting Conversations, New Mexico. That's Interesting Conversations NM dot org, which is the most nonprofit nonprofit organization in the world. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, coronavirus, which I've been researching for classes that I teach over at the university, and um, I want to uh, do a shout out to Toby Eunice. He's providing technical support for us tonight. He actually has his own little studio, uh, Video Taro, and he was kind enough to volunteer to support this because all of us believe in communicating as much as we can right now. I'm also going to cheat a little bit and say hello to my brother in Seattle, Riley. Give me a call, buddy. I haven't heard from you in a while. All right. While I do have... Oh, uh, and so Toby will be providing technical support. And can we have the slides? Uh, yes. Let me uh, get that over to that screen there. While I do have a rather elaborate slide presentation that we will be posting on our website, um, I'm just going to hit a couple of highlights up front and then uh, try to answer questions as much as possible. And wherever we don't have questions, I'll jump <coughs> through a few of the slides of things that I think are worth talking about. May I add something? Yes, please. So if you want to reach out to Dr. Brown, uh, you can do so by calling 202-815-1171 uh, uh, and leave a voicemail right now. Later on, we'll open up that phone line. But if you don't want to leave a voicemail or call in, you can also send a text message to that number. That's 202-815-1171. I'll continue to repeat it. And when you see the full screen, you'll see the number in the lower third. So we're hoping your questions will drive this uh, episode rather than my slides. The key thing to know about the coronavirus is that it's a moderately severe virus. Virulence, a measure of the badness of a virus or a bacteria, any pathogen, is severity times likelihood. The severity of COVID-19, that's coronavirus 2019, COVID-19, is moderate. It's got somewhere between a 1% and 3% case fatality rate, meaning if you get it across the board, there's a 1% to 3% chance of death. However, there's a 15% to 20% chance of winding up in the intensive care unit for a while, and then about 80% of us will more or less shrug it off like we would a cold or a flu. But it spreads really, really fast and easily. And so the... Um, Transmission of it is the big problem with COVID-19. I do not represent any official agency. I'm a retired emergency physician and now a full-time educator. And this thing we're doing tonight grew out of materials I prepared for my classes. I'm not a public health specialist or an infectious disease specialist. I'm sharing my own researches. And when I predict or extrapolate, these are my personal educated estimates or opinions. That's important to know because the world is full of pundits and I don't want to be one of them. I have mostly tried to be an explainer for information that you can readily find on the WHO and CDC sites and to answer some of the common questions and the ones that come up tonight. So I could save you some legwork and maybe some confusion but there's nothing I'm going to talk about you couldn't have accessed for yourself. I've just spent a bunch of time on it. Everything about coronavirus is going to be changing rapidly. Today's date is March 13th, 2020. That's important because by March 15th, 2020, some of this will be significantly different. When I got up this morning, there were four known cases in New Mexico, Right now, there are five known cases. That's the situation we're in. It's very dynamic. Here are what I think are the most important key points. The next slide will show you information sources you can go to to stay up to date. I think most of us will get it. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. Estimates range from 20 to 80% of us will get it, but I predict that it will be on the higher rather than the lower side. Few of us will die. Most who do will be elderly or be medically frail. The exponential rate of spread of this will make this a disaster much more so than the mortality rate. We, meaning here healthcare workers, 
are going to be overwhelmed. So the key take home I want you to get from all of this is that the things we're all going to do to help each other are to flatten the curve. If we can spread out the distribution of this over time, we may have enough healthcare resources for everybody. But if we all get infected in a short amount of time, and I'll show you a drawing of this, we're going to overwhelm our resources. Some of the questions I get have to do with what should I keep at home and how much of it. I want to be careful here because while it's prudent to have some things on hand at home, I do recommend that, hoarders are making things worse for everybody. And unfortunately, there is much about our culture that promotes hoarders. We're a very me-first culture, and this is where it's going to come back and bite us. Over and underreacting are both the wrong answer. I was an underreactor, frankly, until a few days ago, until I began to realize that really we do need to talk. But overreacting, kids going to school in baggies, buying up all the toilet paper at your Walmart so nobody else has any, fighting each other over resources, that's a bigger problem than the bug itself is. And frankly, it's a purely human problem. Don't be that person. This is a time of thoughtful learning which is not really our forte. Here are sites I highly recommend you go to for good information, good up-to-date information. And probably 80% of what's on my slides was extracted from these sites. Vox also had a really good article we'll make reference to, and a mathematician's statistical site as well that are contained in the slides. I've also included in the slides how to make your own sanitizer and how to make your own sterilizing solution using household bleach. So the recipes are here, the instructions are here, how to make them and how to use them. Uh, this is a good time to look at some of the questions we're getting. So uh, the first question, and I'm going to remind everybody, I'm going to go back to full screen so that they can see the number. If you have a question for Dr. Coffey, please text it to, to this number right now, 202-815-1171. Uh, it is more likely we're going to be able to see it rather than watching it in the chat room as it scrolls by. Uh, and... Um, we can get to that question. So the first question is, given that I am a healthy 60-year-old male, I have the time to spend on a worthy project. I tend to be outgoing and active such that I feel I will sooner or later be exposed to the virus and I'm not going to get younger or healthier. Would it make sense to go out and get the virus now, take it on in my own terms and timing to acquire immunity? So I, I like this question a lot. It's actually a really intelligent question, and I could practically have written that one. I'm 65, but otherwise could have word for word asked the same question. The answer is clearly no. Do not go out and get this now. And the reason is we need to spread out the rate at which people are getting infected. That's to flatten the curve part. In fact, I'm going to leaf ahead to that and show you what I mean by that. But it's important that we slow the spread of this as much as we can. So while I also would like to get this thing like today, get it over with this week and be immune afterwards, which we're not sure but probably is how it's going to work, that would be the wrong answer. So let uh, me show you why. Before you... Channel, I'm kind of worried about. All right. So before you uh, proceed, I, I would like to, uh, uh, in response to the gentleman's question, because I'm in that age group, uh, is although you may go out and and find yourself acquiring uh, the virus. At the same time, you have the potential to infect a lot of other people in the process of you. That's why I want to go to this slide. Oh, okay. I want, to, right. I want to show you something. A picture is going to be worth a thousand. All right. Words let's here. do that. All right. It's uh, not working. Oh, okay. Hang on just a sec. So I'm going to do this. And I got then, excited. Yeah. Let me just do that for you. That's that's what's happening. Okay. Now you can advance it. All right. That's why it was going dark. You were going through my set of... Uh, here we go. So the pink graph here shows what happens if the coronavirus spreads rapidly through our population. The dotted horizontal line is our current healthcare resources. How many ventilators do we have? How many ICU beds do we have? How many healthcare workers do we have? And at, if the rate of spread is too quick, then the peak will be greatly higher than the amount of medical resources that we have right now. 
and a lot of people will not get the care they need. But if the same number of people were to get infected over a longer period of time, so the area under the gray curve is the same as the area under the peak curve. To my eye, it doesn't look that way, but that's the intention of the graph. Uh, this, by the way, came from Vox. Thank you very much, Vox, for that excellent article, which I have linked to in the slides. If we can stay underneath that curve, we can take care of everybody. In China, it has already occurred that hospitals that were completely devoted to taking care of coronavirus patients pushed people out who needed treatment for diabetes, cancer, pneumonia, congestive heart failure, all the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. We don't want that here. If we can flatten this curve, we may have enough ventilators to go around. We may have enough doctors and nurses. Remember that healthcare workers are always overextended. You know, every year articles come out about how overextended healthcare workers are. And bear in mind, I'm clinically retired. I'm not uh, feathering my own nest here. Healthcare workers are so overextended that they retire young, as I did. They commit suicide. I haven't done that yet. They, <laughs> they get burned out. They get disinterested. They get sick earlier. If healthcare workers get sick or they get exhausted and go home, then the ones who are a little sturdier have to shoulder that burden, meaning they're going to get sick and exhausted, though they would have been okay had their colleagues stayed on the job. Uh -huh. Now they go, and the last remaining Green Beret level guys, they get burnt out and wind up getting sick and going home, and there's nobody left to take care of you. All of this is why we must flatten the curve, and that is why, letter writer, while I agree with you, I want the same thing you want, the answer is no, don't do that. Delay getting infected as long as you possibly can by using basic stuff that your grandmother would have known about before antibiotics were infected. Wash your hands, avoid crowds, don't go out unnecessarily, and uh, you know, have the courtesy not to cough on people. So th that brings up another question. Uh, the incubation period on this particular virus is extremely long. It's two to 14 days. Yeah. Now, remember, everything's provisional, but it looks like 2 to 14 days, with the average running less than a week. So a moderate, it's a pretty garden variety uh, incubation period. Mm -hmm. well, but, but what I mean is, if I were to acquire the virus today, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that I'm a carrier, am I, am I uh, is it, do I have the potential, if, before I realize I have the virus, to affect all the people around me? Once so I'm a carrier, I'm a, I'm a carrier, right? You don't, there's the bulk no... of the experience so far suggests you're not contagious before you're symptomatic. Oh. There are one or two cases where people may have spread it before they were symptomatic, or that we may just not correctly understand what occurred. Mm -hmm. But it appears to be that in general, when you have symptoms is when you're infectious. Ah, nice. Yeah. Well, not nice. So I mean, nothing's nice Well, but I mean, this. it's helpful. You know, avoid people with symptoms. Avoid going out if you have symptoms. Uh, we'll do a lot to help flatten that curve. I'm going to say that over and over throughout this podcast because it is the key to getting through this crisis. Uh, so for those of you that have a question for Dr. Coffee, I'm going to go ahead and open up the phone lines because I'm sure we have some folks out there that uh, would like to uh, call in and ask you a question. But... Uh, the number is the same. So if you have uh, questions for Dr. Coffee, you can do one of two things right now. You can send a text message to the number right below where he's sitting, 202-815-1171. That's a toll-free number if you're using cell phone services. Uh, or you can call right now and you can uh, talk to him with your questions. And since I've got his attention and we're sharing a room here, I'm 71 years old. I'm in reasonably good health, but I suffer from high blood pressure, for example. Um, uh, there's a chance I may get it. What are the chances for this 71-year-old in better than average health? I exercise regularly. I eat Right. What are the chances that it's it's uh, I'm going to die from it? What what so what, what's the difference between? I'll the show you another from? picture that will. Okay, hold on before you do that. Here. Let me change it and give me a second to. All right, go ahead. I know I really messed you up last time, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> it just surprised me. Right. There we go. So this these two uh, slides uh, from the CDC show. The top one is the age distribution of people who get the disease. It's the same age distribution as the population. We're pretty much all exposed, uh, you know, 
equally likely to get it. Although children seem to have some degree of protection from this. That's unusual. With mm -hmm. most diseases, the extremes of age are where you right. see your fatalities. The young and the old. With this one, it's the old end, not the young end mm -hmm. so far. Now, the lower one shows us who actually dies of the disease. And look at that disproportionate skew to the right. So, Toby, both you and I, because we're older than 60, mm -hmm. we're in these last three columns mm -hmm. here. Okay? And so the rates for us go up. So while the overall fatality, case fatality rate is 1 to 3%, depending on which data set you look at, uh, it's all grouped at the higher end. So for you and I, it's probably something in the 5 to 7% range. So that, that means for every 100 people in my age group that get the virus, five to seven of those hundred people are going to die from that virus. Well, actually, it's higher than that, I realize. Okay. One block equals one percent. I see the key now that I didn't see before. Uh, and you and I, it's a pretty high percentage. Yes, we it? don't want to get this disease. All right. Well, good. I'm okay with that. So uh, the other thing that I wanted to ask before we get to the questions, and again, if you, I'm going to go back to the... Uh, it's looking like around 12 12 15 percent. 15 percent maybe. All right. Uh, so I have uh, my... Uh, daughter, her husband, and uh, grandchildren mm -hmm. in Albuquerque. My son and his grandchildren, my, my grandchildren. Uh, so uh, there's a point at which I've got to say, don't come and visit me or... That point was yesterday. Okay. Or right. maybe January. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I would avoid them until you can be vaccinated. They're working on a vaccine right now very likely they will successfully produce it. Mm -hmm. Optimistic estimates suggest this time next year. Right. So roughly spring of 2021. That's assuming things go very well, which is a big assumption to make. But a lot of resources are being thrown at it. We've had practice with coronavirus before. Uh, and so something like spring of 2021 or maybe within a year of that, somewhere in that one-year range, and I would get vaccinated before I would consider visiting your grandkids and so forth. Otherwise, Skype and things like that. And I'm yeah. sorry because this is a painful thing to say to people, but it's the kind of adaptation we need to make right now. Yeah, two of my daughters are having, uh, they're both pregnant, one's due in uh, the end of March, one's due the beginning of August. One lives in Washington, one lives in Florida. You're suggesting that it's a good idea for me not to go visit? I am. Uh, and, of course, the travel itself is a problem. You'd be yeah. confined on a plane with recirculating air. Uh -huh. You don't know where their people have been, but you know that they're travelers. Uh, it, would, it would be an unreasonable risk, I would say, to take at this time. So uh, Also, one of the questions I specifically looked at was, is this a threat for pregnant women? And the answer is a clear, oh, we don't know yet. So maybe, uh, but I would assume it is until we're sure. Uh -huh. I, do, I do want you to make uh, that point again, because I was... Uh, uh, my my, uh, I imagined this, that once you got the virus, you were a carrier and you shared the virus. But you made the point that to the best of your knowledge, you're not, uh, you're not, uh, what's the word? I can't remember the word. The materials used. I looked at was that you're not infectious. Infectious. Longer than 10 days after your last symptom. So somewhere between the last of your symptoms and 10 days later, you stop being infectious. So it's so that... Everybody quarantines themselves. I'm talking voluntary self-quarantine. Right. The quarantine is a topic we might cover tonight. Uh, voluntary self-quarantine for 10 days after your last symptom would be reasonable protection for the people around you. All right. So let's go to a couple of questions uh, from the uh, text messages. Uh, does getting the virus confer immunity? It is thought now that it does. It's so recent, remember it only started in January, that uh, we have to make inferences based on experiences with MERS and SARS and other coronaviruses, and based on what we're seeing so far, uh, it appears that you are immune once you've had it. One woman is thought to have gotten it, tw may have gotten it twice, but there's some thought that she may have relapsed rather than reacquired it. So is there any data coming out of China who's been dealing with this since January that, that gives us any indications about... Exactly. It appears that they do not get it twice. Uh, okay. Well, good. I have one more question. That Most of the data we have is from China because that's where the bulk of the cases have been. And it's still where the spread is the fastest. And are you comfortable? I know there's been some uh, conversation. It tends to be associated with, uh, with uh, people that believe in conspiracy theories. But uh, is there any uh, sense that uh, China is avoiding 
helping us, helping uh, the rest of the world kind of understand this. They're not holding back data. They're not doing anything. Boy, in the way that I've looked at it, it seems that China has been nothing but generous with yeah. information. In fact, they have shared the things they've done well and the things they feel were errors. They've been very open and transparent as far as I can see. Now, this is not a question I looked at. I didn't like research this right. in a forensic yeah. way. Right. But from everything I've seen, China has been a stand-up uh, uh, member of the world community, as you could ask for on this. Mm, great. That's good to hear. They've been a little rough on their own people. Their quarantines are fairly draconian. We'd like to avoid that here, and flattening the curve is what we need to do to avoid that problem here. Uh, so I'm on, they say, I'm on the Interesting Conversations Facebook page and not seeing anything about live streaming. Coffee's Talk, can you help? Uh, the only way I can offer you help is I discovered as I was setting up this live stream that there are two interesting conversation Facebook pages. One has a picture of a mesa, mesa as we say in New Mexico, mesa. on it, and the other has a picture of a sunset. I made this mistake when I was uh, setting this up of using the picture of the mesa. That's the wrong one. We're on interesting conversations with the photograph of the sunset in the background. So that should, uh, that should help you. All right, so we feel like China's uh, contributing. We've heard a lot in the news about uh, our, uh, that the United States, and, and I don't want to point directly to the federal government, but as a, as a nation, we were slow to respond to this. And uh, the effect of that, I, I think now we're being compared to Italy, which did the same thing. They were slow to respond to it. Where are we in terms of our response? And based on where we are in terms of our response, what impact is going to have on the rest of the, uh, as this virus moves forward? Yeah, that's actually a really good question, one that I looked at a lot. So we did well with SARS. Mm -hmm. uh, quarantines worked extremely well with SARS. What year was that? I don't remember when that was. Um, eight years ago, mm -hmm. roughly. Uh, and that one was contained pretty quickly and pretty successfully. It is also a coronavirus, by the way. Um, we did well with H1N1, which had the potential to look a lot like this and wound up kind of being a nothing, and that's partly because public health measures were aggressive. Mm -hmm. On the strength of those experiences, we created a pandemic response office in the White House, but it didn't get used for a little while, so it was disbanded in uh, 2018. And so now we didn't have those lessons learned, those experienced people in place, and those policies in place when this one hit. And in January, we underestimated the risk of it coming our way and becoming our problem. We should learn from this. A biologist, anybody trained in medicine, anybody trained in biology, and anybody trained in epidemiology would say, this is not a special year. The special years were the weird vacation we had for several decades mm -hmm. from these things happening. Mm -hmm. Actually, pandemics are the rule, not the exception. We should assume this is going to happen on a regular basis going forward as far into the future as anyone can see. It's that way going into the past, as far as anyone can see. But we had a little bit of a pandemic drought, and we got comfortable. We shouldn't have done that. So should we have foreseen this? I mean, hindsight is always twenty twenty. Should we foresee the next one? Yes. We need to get our moves down now. Use this one to train ourselves to be a society that has an infrastructure that can roll with a punch like this. And, it, and you compare it to, uh, uh, say, Hurricane Katrina and the lessons we learned from Hurricane Katrina and what we implemented in order to deal with uh, hurricanes after that. So you, you just said something about the coronavirus and how SARS was a coronavirus. Uh, the, the virus that we're probably most experienced with, other than the common cold, is the flu virus. Could you compare the differences? What's yeah. the differences between the cold virus, the flu virus, and a coronavirus? Excellent question. And also, let's go back to the slides. Okay, for a don't do anything yet. Let me. Uh, yeah, yeah. So here, here's actually the way to do it. Get to your slide, and then I'll switch the screen. How's that? Okay. Just. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, hang on, just a sec. Hold on. Wait, wait. Don't do anything yet. Oh, it it takes it anyway. So I'm going to go back to full screen. Then you get to your slide. Okay. Let me know when you're there. Uh, I see. And that way, the that. folks don't have to see you bounce through the slides with you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Although I don't mind that you see that there is a lot of stuff here because this slide will be a posted uh, resource. Uh, 
Again, if you want to reach out uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, Brown, uh, send a text message to 202-815-1171. And if you have a question, you can call that number and uh, we'll put you on the air. All right, you ready? Yep. All right, go ahead. So this chart from the WHO compares the symptoms of coronavirus, cold, and flu. Oh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about when should you call your doc and say, hey, I wonder if I should be tested. That's an important topic. But first, I'm going to answer your question directly, which is to compare the three diseases. So the coronavirus is not a subset of the common cold. Apparently, that's one of the myths that's been traveling around. Uh-huh. Uh, nor is it a variant of the flu. But it behaves very much like the flu in the sense that it's a virus that... Uh, begins in animals and winds up in humans one way or another, uh, that it mutates on a fairly regular basis, and so new variants of it come down the road pretty much every year. Uh Sometimes they're big trouble, like MERS and SARS have been, and now the COVID-19. COVID-19 is an abbreviation of Coronavirus 2019, by the way. That's why it's called that. Uh, So one of the questions that came up that you just reminded me of was, will a flu vaccine help me with this? Uh The answer is, Yes and no. If you get the flu and you get this, you would be much more likely to die or wind up in the ICU. Mm -hmm. So being protected against the flu offers some protection against getting sicker with the coronavirus. But it is not an Mm anti-coronavirus vaccine. The exact same reasoning would apply to the pneumovac, the vaccination against pneumococcal pneumonia. Uh If you had pneumonia and got coronavirus, your mortality rate would be much higher. So getting immunized against pneumonia while there's a coronavirus hanging around, makes a lot of sense to me. So uh, at, the, I, uh, at the beginning of each fall, I get my flu shot, mm-hmm. and I don't know, I, I'm up to date on my Pneumovac pneumonia. is every 10 years. Right, yeah. so I'm up to date there. Yeah. So is that going to help? If yeah, I were to, it absolutely oh, okay. is. All right, well, good. That's good news. Yeah, so I, I get the flu shot every year as mm-hmm. well, mostly because I don't want to miss work. But I would have gotten it for this reason, if for no other. Mm-hmm. So I do recommend that you get those two immunizations yeah, if they apply to you, but not because they immunize against the coronavirus itself. I hope that was clear. Now, the other question is, should I get tested? My answer today will be different than it would be next week because the situation is evolving. Now, while the likelihood that your symptoms are coronavirus is low, I would get tested if you knew you had been exposed to someone who has it or someone who's just been traveling in an endemic area mm-hmm or you yourself have just traveled to an endemic area, or if you think you are particularly ill or particularly vulnerable, like you have COPD, asthma, tuberculosis, um, you know, you're more at risk than the general population, immunocompromised. So those are all lung issues? Yeah, it's it's pulmonary stuff primarily. So for those groups of people, yes, I would recommend that you call your doc and ask about testing. Now, we don't have enough test kits. Uh, we have something over a million test kits and we have uh, 309 million Americans. So we can't test everybody who gets a cold or a flu. We're going to have to pick and choose. As the virus spreads and the likelihood that one of us has it, the likelihood of a positive test would go up and that would mean more testing. But we may just be treating people presumptively at that point because at some point a negative test wouldn't really change our management. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the, so these are the distinctions between yes. them on a more uh, on a more biological basis. What what the the behaviors of these viruses? How are Perfect. they different? Yeah. So I just looked at that today. The coronaviruses attack what are called the cilia. So in your lungs, you have three basic different kinds of cells that line the little air sacs within the lungs, and one of those kinds of cells more more in the uh, tubes in the lungs rather than the air sacs, are called ciliated cells. They have cilia, little wavy fingers on Mm -hmm. them. And their job is to move mucus from where it's produced down in your lungs out into the world and get it outside, get it out of your body. Mm -hmm. This is why we have to keep clearing our throat. It's why we make boogers and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing. It's how we keep our lungs clean. When the cilia don't work, then viruses and bacteria stay around in our lungs and form colonies and make us sicker. Mm -hmm. And so the coronavirus a virus, sets us up to get pneumonia, commonly would be bacterial, and uh, then we get very sick. Smokers already kill their cilia. Cigarettes kill cilia as well. So smokers, by the way, have a much higher mortality rate than non-smokers do, 
with this particular infection. So its, its effect on killing the ciliated cells is the reason this is such a bear, and it's the reason that pulmonary diseases are more important uh, than other... Any comorbidity is going to make you weaker, less able to withstand the infection, but pulmonary ones are really the high-profile ones for this. Uh, COPD, uh, sorry, not COPD, um, uh, sleep apnea, where you have to use a BiPAP machine, I would predict is only a moderate risk factor because it doesn't affect the cilia. Mm -hmm. so, so I want to make sure oh, I understand. And before I finish that, Go ahead. super important, don't bug your doc for antibiotics for coronavirus, colds, Sorry. or flus. Antibiotics do not help with viruses. They can make some situations worse by breeding immunity. But antibiotics probably will be part of the treatment if you become one of the sicker ones, because by then you probably have a bacterial co-infection. Mm. So antibiotics do not help the coronavirus, but they help the complications later of the coronavirus. So I, I want to make sure I understand. It's not the fact... It's not the coronavirus that's going to make me potentially deathly sick. It's the fact that the coronavirus is in my lungs and other things? Well, it has another effect common... as well. Okay, all right. Uh, it also eats craters. It it bites holes in your lungs mm. so that you have the equivalent of a fast leakage progressing emphysema. Yeah. And that is not necessarily recoverable. People who recover from coronavirus may well have lasting uh, respiratory compromise. So you might not be able to run a mile anymore. Or whatever your previous, um, what we call physiologic reserve was, may be permanently diminished by getting oh. coronavirus. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, so, uh, it, it, you know, I, in my uh, medicine cabinet, I have uh, some NyQuil, some... Uh, tea, some Theraflu, a couple of other things that help me get through the common cold. Is this going to help with Yes, this? and that brings us back actually to one of the most common questions. What should I stock I'm going to go on? back to our, our uh, screen, full Good. screen. I don't actually want to ignore that question. I just don't want to uh, encourage hoarders. Like today, uh, or yesterday maybe, I went out and bought uh, one bottle of NyQuil uh -huh. and uh, one bottle of DayQuil. Uh -huh. Um, that's what I use if I get a symptomatic right. enough yeah. bug. Um, having a cool mist vaporizer in your house is a good idea for symptomatic relief for all the upper respiratory bugs. We're going to get one of them every year anyway, right? right? Um, Tylenol and Motrin for the aches and pains, which are a significant feature of this bug. So the usual things you would do for a flu are the right answer for your garden variety, the 80% of coronaviruses that act mm -hmm. like kind of a flu. Okay, And yes, I would keep those things around. I'd keep around some non-perishable food, not months' worth, but mm -hmm. you know, a week or two's worth. Right. Uh, I'd, I'd keep around, uh, oh, you know, beverages that you might like to drink. Yes, it's fine to have a little extra toilet paper so you don't have to make an extra run to the store, you know, but not like two months' worth of toilet right. paper. Be yeah, reasonable. You know? right. Be reasonable. Leave some stuff for your neighbors. In fact, the rougher you make it on your neighbors, the harder it'll be to flatten the curve, and the more likely you are to die of coronavirus because you, the hoarder, made it worse for everybody, everybody else. else. So do all these things, but do them moderately. Mm -hmm. So uh, back to the uh, idea of uh, an injection being made available, and you, I've heard both on the news and you just reinforced it, that it could be up to a year before... It'll be a minimum of a year. Minimum of a year before, uh, even if the, the pharmaceutical industry goes as it f full tilt, it'll Which be a are. year, even yeah. if, even, and because they have to do the testing, et cetera, et cetera. So once that vaccine is developed... Uh, can I, like my flu vaccine, can I get that vaccine from here on out yes. in order to protect myself? Yeah, and they may have to tweak it as new variants of coronavirus Which is what they do with along, the flu. Which we expect. So yeah. again, I would say it's a very similar, I predict a very similar pattern to the flu. And so why wasn't it developed, why wasn't that vaccine developed prior to this? I mean, I would with assume... With MERS and SARS? Because we thought COVID we finished the job, we dusted our hands and walked away. Ah. By the way, MERS and SARS are still out there. So would a vaccine developed for COVID-19 help prevent MERS and SARS or the, my acquiring, my being diagnosed with it? It would depend on what part of the virus the vaccine went after, but my prediction is we'd need a multivalent virus to mm -hmm. cover those things. All right. We do have a question from uh, the room. Let me 
see if I can get that. Uh, what if closing all schools at once is the wrong way to flatten the curve? Consider all students and staff return at once. Now, if the closings were staggered, then the contact spread would be spread and flatter. So the answer is we have to make a best bet. And some of, we're going to do a whole bunch of things, and some of them in retrospect will turn out to have been the wrong things. But there are people with experience working at WHO, CDC, and other public health organizations. Um, and experience is guiding the advice that uh, government agencies and schools and universities are getting right now. So we're betting on the things that appear in the past to have been the most effective or that appear now to be the most likely to work. We're not going to be right on every one of those bets. Hey, welcome to medicine. Welcome to the world of uncertainty that we all live in anyway. While I'm thinking of this, I want to um, give a shout out to public health services. When I was in medical school, they talked about careers in public health service, and I didn't think I was interested, mm -hmm. frankly. It looked, like, it looked boring and uninteresting mm -hmm. to me and low level. Holy cow, was I wrong. Over the years since then, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of public health service people. And had I known then what I know now, I probably would have chosen to work with them. It's an amazingly dedicated bunch of people who take lower paychecks in exchange for doing meaningful work on behalf of the public. It's a uniform service that is, in, from my experience, everybody uh -huh. I've personally met, uh -huh. deeply committed to the job as opposed to the career. Mm -hmm. And uh, had I chosen that path, were I a public health physician, I'd be bragging about it. I would be so proud of it. And thank you guys for the work that you do. So we have the best people with the best experience doing their best to guide us, at least among the professionals. I'm not sure that's true at every level, but among the professionals. Well, uh, I had experience with the public health service when I was in high school and college because I used to spend my summers working at the public health service hospital, uh, Native American hospital in Santa Fe. And uh, I, I'm of the same opinion, a dedicated uh, group of professionals who are committed to their work and, uh, and who put all their energy into being successful. Guys, I am so sorry I underestimated you. <laughs> Good. All right. Uh, let me see if there's uh, some other questions. All right. So if you do have a question for uh, Dr. Coffey, there's two ways to reach out to him. Uh, I haven't quite figured out. I'm not a Facebook user, so I haven't quite figured out if you're asking questions in the chat room. I can't see them on my processor screen in front of an, in front of me. So the best thing that you can do is if you do have a question, please take a moment to uh, text it to 202-815-1171. And if you would like to talk to Dr. Coffey about your particular situation related to the spread uh, or hopefully the lack of spread of the coronavirus, you can call him at that number as well, 202-815-1171 and get directly in touch with him. So um, we, we showed that chart of the relationship or the lack of relationship between coronavirus, cold, and flu. We understand that there are uh, different kinds of virus, that they behave differently in the body. The simple fact of the matter is, and I heard someone say this just the other day on uh, as they were interviewing uh, a virology uh, doctor, he said that all these viruses are out in the boonies, that they, they shouldn't, the impression I got was that if we didn't go out into places that we weren't supposed to be, the forest, the wild animals and things like that, we, we wouldn't acquire uh, these viruses. I think he's referring to the origination of the virus. Okay. Now, one of the reasons why the flu tends to come from China, and it's thought this may have contributed to the origin of coronavirus, is that uh, farmers in China manage their animals differently than farmers do in America. Mm -hmm. And they typically are in much closer proximity to their animals. They often bring them inside at night, uh, things like that, something that hasn't been the habit here in, mm -hmm. uh, in the western part, what we call the western part of the world. So when diseases that mutate within animals jump to humans, it's easier for that to happen in China, typically, than it is elsewhere. That's really the biggest difference that I'm personally aware of in terms of why so many of these seem to migrate from east to west. Is the coronavirus that if I were to acquire it today here in the United States significantly different from the coronavirus that launched itself in China? To the best of my knowledge, it's the same virus. However, it can mutate at any time. So we could certainly wind up with some variation on that theme. But right now, we seem to have the same bug they do. And what causes it to mutate? Um, 
all species mutate at some baseline rate, mm-hmm. some faster than others. Coronavirus and flu are faster than a lot of other viruses. Uh, HIV mutates its coat quite often. That's why it's been so hard to develop a vaccine. Mm-hmm. Um, all that said, it's also the case that uh, one generation for us is like a million generations for a virus. So they have a lot more time to evolve than we do. So you mentioned the idea of flattening the curve so that we're not competing. We, uh, as the carriers, are not competing with the health services that could be uh, provided. Uh, Has any estimate been made as to uh, the dimensions on that curve? How bad is it going to get? How long is it going to last? Or is that all hypothetical? Let's go to a slide. All right, go to your slide first, and then I'll switch over. All right. Oh, uh, wait, 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 wait. wait. (laughs) Sorry. Hang on. Okay. Uh, All right. Go to your slide first. No. Here, I have to do it this way. Hold on. All right. Go to your slide. Okay. And then I'll switch this over. I have to find a particular... uh, It's okay. This website is one of the ones I wanted to uh, give a shout out to anyway. Oh, this section on COVID myths I want to do next, by the way. All right. I want to make sure we don't miss the myths before we move on to other stuff. Well, and also we want to spend some time on what we can recommend to our listeners about uh, flattening their contribution to flattening the curve. Uh, I think that was it. Stat. No. There we go. Stat news. So statnews.com. Okay. Hang on. Are you ready? Yep. All right. So we're going to go back. We'll show that screen. All right. Go ahead. Statnews.com is a website where statisticians get together and crunch numbers for each other. Uh, It's a a total nerd heaven. I only uh, came across them in the course of researching for this topic. And uh, I want to thank the uh, person who did these calculations. I don't have his name, but here's the link to that website. So... um, some of the information, uh, fomites. So if you if you cough on your hand and then uh, turn a doorknob, how long does that surface stay contaminated? It's thought not very long, maybe a, a few hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, this stuff doesn't tolerate being dried out mm-hmm. out in the air. So um, we think f- that fomites, that is contaminated surfaces, are not yet a big deal. Um, I'm looking for the calculations that he did. Sorry, I thought I had them right here. That's all right. Well, uh, I'm not going to switch over. They're just watching you go through your slides right now. But <clears throat> So ask your question again. Oh, here we go. All right. So this is uh, the point, the, the actual like, numbers for when we're going to swamp out right. uh, so the, hospital the, resources. Is there any estimate of the so according height to these or length of the curve? studies that he links to, if we don't, do, if we don't flatten the curve, mm-hmm. we can expect a doubling uh, every six days. That's really, really fast. That means a million U.S. cases by the end of April and two million by May, according to this guy's calculations. Um, this trend won't slow. The curve won't begin to flatten until it hits at least 1% of the population. That's 3.3 million Americans um, and 7.4 million by May 13th, and so on. The government has about 2.8 hospital beds per 1,000 people, and we run at about a 68% occupancy. Now, that actually is a deceptive number because many of the beds that aren't occupied are already spoken for. Mm-hmm. They're being cleaned in between patients and things like that, or they're waiting for someone to be able to get to them and clean them, or somebody's waiting two days for their discharge to come through. So really, every hospital is operating at greater than 100% capacity pretty much all the time, mm-hmm. at least in ur- busy urban areas. Uh, in Statistically, 15 to 20% of cases are going to wind up in a hospital bed. At a 10% hospital rate, uh, hospitalization rate, 10%, that's less than China has been mm-hmm. seeing, they say all of the beds would be filled by about May 10th. And remember, that's a really conservative estimate. Okay? And 
the patients require weeks of care. The ones who wind up in the ICU don't get over it in 10 to 14 days, which is the mild version. They're going to be sicker for a lot longer, and some of them will require ongoing health care later. Also, they'll push patients out of the hospital, so the mortality rate won't just be from the COVID. It'll be from people who aren't getting the care they need for all the other slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Okay? This guy says, if I'm wrong by a factor of two, that's huge margin, okay? It only changes the timeline by six days in either direction, okay? And if 20% of cases require a hospitalization, we run out of beds by May 4th. The remarkable thing is doubling the rate of hospitalization only moved it up by six days. The other thing is we are definitely running out of hospital beds in May unless something really amazing changes the curve, unless we seriously flatten it. Okay. So uh, so let's let's go back to that again. I'm going to use myself as an example. Let's say uh, somehow or the other I uh, uh, I acquire the virus. Uh, I'm not. There's no indications of infection for the first ten. Let's say ten days. We mm-hmm. we know it might not be as much as that. So you get it today. So it's March 23rd when you begin coughing. Right. So I start coughing. And I decide, you know what, I have this, I'm shutting my doors, I'm not letting anybody come over, I'm going to lay in bed, I'm going to take my Dayquil, my NyQuil, I'm going to sleep, drink water, and wait until this go, goes away. Pretty much my plan. Okay. So at what point do I need, let's say, I'm not as healthy as I think I am, or you're as healthy as you think you are, at what point do I have to say, you know what, my, I get my health care through the VA. Yeah. And the VA serves really old guys like me. <laughs> The VA is great, by the no, way. No, no, no. They, they really get underestimated because they're so overextended. But um, I, the VA is another group we don't really take enough pride in. I am very grateful to the VA for having yeah. extended my life the, as long as they have. So at what point do I say the Dayquil's not working, the NyQuil's not working, the lots of water's not working? I really need to get to the hospital. So first of all, because you're over 60, I'd have a low threshold. I'm in the club, buddy. Yeah. All right. If you find that you have trouble, if you're getting winded, going to the bathroom or going out to the kitchen to make your meals, it's time to uh, call your doc. And that winding is the first indication, you think? That's the first one I would predict. But right. You I mean, you may be coughing, else. you may be sneezing. Hoarders, listen up. One. The magic number here is one. One. Each household should buy one pulse oximeter. You can get these things for like 15 bucks. Mm-hmm. And if your pulse oximetry is dropping if you're under about 94, and certainly under 90. Mm -hmm. If you're under 90, call an ambulance. If you're under 94, call your doctor. Okay. Okay? So using a pulse oximeter to monitor your own respiratory status would be very helpful. Um, The other thing is if you're getting winded doing something, what are called activities of daily living, Mm -hmm. like making your meals and going to the restroom, Mm -hmm. then it's time to throw in the towel and get some help. Mm. Okay? doesn't mean you'll wind up in the ICU. You might wind up in a hospital bed, but you want to be where people can keep an eye on you at that point. The reason I'm smiling is because I don't know how many years ago I I was in the hospital for something that required me leaving the hospital with that device that you just yeah. and it's in a box outside. I'm going to have to pull it Good. out. You know, well, so. the first one I bought, because I, I used it in my work, yeah. I spent 350 of my own dollars on, and that was a bargain price. I shopped for mm-hmm. that one. But now you can get these guys for like 15 bucks. Mm-hmm. And at that price, I think it is a reasonable thing for each household to have. For example, uh, I made a baby kit for my friend when he and his wife had their first child, and mm-hmm. I included a pulse oximeter in it. Very smart. All right. All right, we do have a couple more questions. I'm going to go back to the uh, full screen. Uh, And I want to make sure that before we end our conversation tonight, uh, we talk about preventative measures. And the myths. And and the myths, yeah, yeah. So let's uh, see what we have here in the room. Um, How long might it take for a minus 19 to evolve? Oh, oh, a COVID, an A minus, an A19 into a new version. Talking about the the virus... uh, uh, mutating into another version. Uh, that question can't be answered numerically, but it could be the next hour. It could be five years. Hmm. It just happens when it happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a random event. All right. Let me get to the next question before we move on. I understand there are two strands of the coronavirus. If you get the weaker strand, is it possible to still get the mutated, stronger version of the virus? I have no information on that. It's a great question, and I'll go learn about it, but I don't know anything about that. That that sounds like one of the things that's traveling through social media for some reason. Well, there are two definite presentations. 80% of people get what amounts to a flu, what we normally think of as a garden variety flu. Mm -hmm. The other 20% get a lot sicker. That might be what you're thinking of. 
I didn't read anywhere in any of the things I looked at that there are two separate strands, a mild one and a major one. And we think but are not absolutely sure that getting the, the one strand that we're talking about confers immunity. So let's go go find your slides on uh, the myths. Okay. Let's talk about that, and uh, you can go now. And then I'll, when you're there, you let me know, and I'll I'll switch over to the screen. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to uh, ask uh, Dr. Coffee a question, make sure you text a message to 202-815-1171. If you would like to call and speak to Dr. Coffee, please feel free to call the same number. If you'd like us to call you, text us your phone number and ask us to call you. We can do the same thing. It's All right. way more fun if we talk about the stuff you're interested in than if we talk about the stuff I'm interested in. Exactly. All right, here you go. There's your screenshot. All right, so I found that there were several pages out there of myths, and so I just basically copied them over, um, and I've uh, credited them here. I hope that's okay. If any uh, content owners want me to take down material, I will. So one thing people were thinking was, well, when the weather warms up, won't that make it go away like it does for colds and the flu? Uh, two reasons why, no. So one is colds and flus uh, may be affected by climate, but COVID doesn't seem to be. It's, it's spreading in different parts of the world, including the Mediterranean, like mm -hmm. Italy, yeah. at similar rates. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem to care what the climate is. Uh, but the other reason is, this is interesting, in the past, cold and flu season was thought to be due to the fact that we stay inside when it's cold and nasty outside. So we're all together and we cough on each other and breathe on each other and we spread bugs around. I would predict that in the future, as the planet warms up, we're all going to stay inside in hot weather with our air conditioners and breathe on each other and cough on each other. Mm -hmm. So we may wind up with two uh, epidemic seasons every year. So uh, I had, I honestly had no idea that the cold and flu season was related to the change in temperature. I is don't that, think it is. I think it's okay, related so, to the change in human behavior. Okay. So it's it can be kind of a myth to believe that cold and flu season go away in the summer. It's not that, that somehow those viruses are, are affected by the heat. It's that we get out of the closed space. If the infectious disease guys say that I'm wrong, they're right and I'm wrong. But to the best of my knowledge, it's not the, it's not the weather. It's the change in behavior. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Hot baths do not prevent infection. Now, this is not a silly myth. Uh, for example, there are some bugs that don't tolerate moderate rises in body temperature, and so we can kill them by heating ourselves up. That's why we spike fevers, but it does not appear to help with uh, coronavirus. Remember, though, that hand washing still is important and was a big, important part of controlling MERS and SARS as well. Mosquitoes do not transmit COVID-19. There are some mosquito-borne illnesses that are a big deal, West Nile virus, uh, malaria, but this is not one of them. Mosquitoes are irrelevant to this particular problem. Hand dryers are not effective in killing uh, COVID-19. Apparently, the hot air is not hot enough to kill the bug. However, drying your hands at all and washing them thoroughly and then drying them is effective. Uh -huh. Some people apparently are using ultraviolet lamps to sterilize their hands. That kind of makes sense. We, we you know, get ultraviolet from the sunshine and so forth. Mm -hmm. My hands get a suntan, but hey, I'm not infected. Mm -hmm. Seems like a good idea, right? However, uh, they can cause damage to the skin and mm -hmm. ultimately can increase your lifetime risk of skin cancers skin and cancer. so forth. Yeah. So I think it's fine to use ultraviolet radiation on inanimate surfaces like fomites that we talked about, mm -hmm. though I don't know how effective they are for this virus. But I wouldn't use them on your own skin. Uh, tell us again what uh, fomites are. So fomites are when I cough on or touch an inanimate object. Like I hand you a pen or money. Cash is actually something we're going to have to think differently about. Cash is the dirtiest thing we hand each other on a regular basis. So because it's an inanimate object, not a bug like a mosquito that bites you, but it has bugs on it that can infect you, that's what the word fulmite refers to. So, so the infection, I want to make sure I understand the infection. The infection comes, let's say uh, you're infected, uh, you sneeze on your wallet, you pay me the $10 you owe me, I take the $10, put it in my wallet, and then I rub my face. Is exactly. That, is that exactly the right. route? Oh, yep. Okay. All right. Yep. I want to make sure it's not just... So using ultraviolet on what you think might be fulmites certainly does make sense. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, thermal scanners, scanners are being used in some places, like, for example, airport screening and other crowded places, to look for people with fever. 
not everybody with COVID will have fever, so thermal scans won't find them. And not everybody with an elevated temperature has COVID. So it's a screening tool, but it's not either sensitive or specific. That is, it'll overcall and undercall <laughs> by a wide margin. So it's a coarse screening tool with some value, but not a reliable one. Spring alcohol or chlorine all over your body will not kill viruses that have already entered your body. So if you've gotten this bug, dousing yourself on the outside with Purell, bathing in it would have no positive effect at all. Um, rinsing your nose with saline not only will not protect you, but I would predict would put you more at risk because the mucus in your nose is its protection. Rinsing it out with saline probably makes you more likely to get mm. infected rather than reducing the risk. Uh, garlic always gets credit for being protective against everything in the world, but it is not. there's no known mechanism by which it would help to prevent you from getting COVID, except if you eat a lot of garlic, other people will stay at an appropriate distance Six feet and then you the won't movie. get infected. <laughs> Um, no particular age group is more likely to get infected, except somehow children seem to get a lower rate of infection. But age does heavily influence how likely you are to get very sick. We talked about antibiotics. They have no role unless you get a secondary bacterial infection. There is presently no specific medicine that will prevent or treat coronavirus but symptomatic medicines, like we talked about a little while ago, Nyquil, are fine, Nyquil, and yeah. I plan to use Elta, them when Elta I get symptoms. the bugs, which I expect to get. Uh, COVID is worse than the flu. It's 10 to 20 times worse than the flu. Um, uh, not much else to say about that. Mm -hmm. Animals do not appear to spread the disease. Even if it began in animals, it's not the case that they're the cause of spreading it. We are. Face masks are something you should wear if you have COVID to protect me, but they're not something that will protect you from me, and that's because they're not airtight. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, so, and don't hoard face masks. The fewer face masks there are for healthcare workers, the more you're going to regret it later. Hoarders, you need to get that stuff back out to the people who need it. Keep a little bit for yourself, but return the rest of it specifically to hospitals, because that's where we're going to get overwhelmed. And when that happens, you, the hoarder, will die, deservedly, because you screwed your neighbor. And I'll be happy about it. Okay? Um, it's not a common cold variant. It is a variant of MERS and SARS. There's no minimum time of exposure. Apparently, one of the myths was uh, you have to be with someone for five minutes or more to get infected. They cough on you once, and you throw a bad dice roll, you're infected. Um, but the more time you spend in the presence of someone with the infection, the greater the risk. Mm -hmm. That would still be true. Do not, uh, I can't believe I have to say this, but do not use bleach or alcohol internally to try to kill the virus. Drinking alcohol, ethanol, like whiskey or vodka, wouldn't be strong enough. And uh, ethanol, uh, sorry, methanol and bleach are toxic and you will die, but it won't be from coronavirus. So the infection's in your lungs. It's not like you're going to drown yourself in alcohol in order to right. kill the virus. But don't inhale these yeah, things yeah. either because they would chew great big holes in your lungs right. and leave you much sicker than the virus mm. would have. Packages from China are probably safe. And the reason is this stuff doesn't tolerate drying out in the air. Now, I suppose if you got a package of something wet or like live animals or... I don't know why anybody would ship produce from China, but if you did, those might be a different story. Things that ship moist, I would think about. But uh, dry goods should not be a problem coming from China. Uh, there are no home remedies, nothing you can do at home, other than avoid ex uh, avoidable contacts with other people that will protect you from this. Vitamin C is not protective. Essential oils, colloid... Blah, blah, blah. None of that's going to help you. Now, one of the myths was this stuff spreads fecal orally. That means poop. Uh, it's thought not to, but just today there was an article suggesting maybe. So mostly people who get COVID do not have GI symptoms. Today's article that I was reading, I didn't cite it on the slides here, was saying a certain subset of COVID people 
also have things like vomiting and diarrhea and may have gotten it fecal orally. That is very preliminary. Currently, the official word is it is not spread fecal orally. But watch this space. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me there. Um, like gastroenteritis, like GI flu. It's not, a, it's not a GI bug. It's not spread by going to the oh, bathroom oh, and not okay. washing your All hands. Right. Okay. Plenty yeah. of other things are, but not this one. Yeah. Probably. Maybe that advice might be different a few days from now. Okay. Uh, warmer months may not slow the spread. And hey, conspiracy theories, right? I'm just going to note that this is under the heading of myths and let you do the math. So one of the things that we have to do is uh, the conspiracy theories that are um, unintentionally spread by our friends, neighbors, and family. How? What's the best way to deal with that without just saying... Don't send me this stuff. That doesn't seem to solve the problem. What's so there's there's no need for a conspiracy. This bug is behaving just the way we expect coronaviruses mm -hmm. to behave. This is just a garden variety event. If it were uh, a super secret weaponized coronavirus, it would be one that looks so exactly what like what happens in the natural world. Like if I get attacked by a bear in the woods tomorrow, it could be Toby's trained bear because he's mad at me. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to assume it's a wild bear that jumped me in the woods. Right, and that's how I feel about coronavirus. There's also nothing I've seen anywhere that has. There's any evidence of it. Um, it certainly wouldn't have been started by the Chinese because that's who's suffering the most from it mm -hmm. right now. But it does remind me that while quarantines are clearly an important and effective method of managing epidemics like this, they also historically have been used to marginalize uh, various groups. Right. The bug doesn't care what your religion is. It cares a little bit about your gender. In China, more men than women get it. It's thought to be because more men smoke. smoke. They're more vulnerable. Um, it definitely doesn't like older people. But it doesn't care if you're a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. It doesn't care if you're Jewish or Catholic or Hindu. It doesn't care if you're black or white. It doesn't care if you're Republican or Democrat. It doesn't care. It cares a little if you're rich or poor. Rich people can send other people to do their shopping for them. But mm. that's about it. So the notion of marginalizing populations would simply be an excuse to use a genuine, legitimate public health measure to be a complete jerk. Mm. Mm. Lord knows it's happened in the past, right? Often, often. In fact, universally. Uh, even as recently as SARS and MERS, this stuff happened. Mm -hmm. So it could certainly happen that somebody who migrated illegally from Mexico wound up getting COVID and spreading it. Mm -hmm. But it's not because they came from Mexico. Right. It's because anybody can get COVID and spread it. Right. You don't have to come from Mexico to do it. It could right. be your next door neighbor. Right. It's going to be you and me sometime right. this year. Yeah. So um, we do have a question from uh, our viewers. Can a pulse oximeter yes. uh, apps on phones also be used? That's an excellent question, and I don't know the answer. It's wouldn't surprise me if they're accurate, but I have not heard of any that are. So all I can say is I'd have to go and do a bit of homework on that. Is, is there an attachment? I mean, don't, don't you need something that allows you to breathe into People it? People have talked about it, but the last ones I heard about were at the prototype stage. Huh. There's no fundamental reason I'm aware of why that couldn't work, but they're like 15 bucks to buy one. Right. And it just fits on your fingertip like an oversized electronic thimble. Huh. So I wouldn't worry about it. I, I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't use an app right now unless there's good evidence that they're accurate, which I don't have. So uh, we're at a stage, I, I, I have, uh, for example, a uh, blood pressure, uh, electronic blood pressure meter. Mm -hmm. I have a device that enables me to t test my blood sugars. Uh, is there anything I can do in terms of testing, whether it's taking my temperature every day or things like that? Is there anything I can do without having to go to the doctor to determine whether or not uh, the changes in my body that would indicate that I've inherited uh, the, the disease? Yeah, there's a couple of things you can do. Um, <coughs> one would be, so get the SAP meter, use it now, find out what's normal for you, which <laughs> may be different than what's normal for me. Right. Find out what your normal heart rate is. Check it several times a day for a few days so you get a good average. Mm -hmm. Find out what's a normal respiratory rate for you. If those increase by more than, and literally I'm picking a number out of the air, but say what I would do for myself, more than about 10% for no obvious reason, then I would uh, start to worry that I might be sicker than I thought I was, and I would call my doc at that point. So there are measurable changes in your metabolism that would indicate you've there's something happening with your body. Sure. 
Uh, what they would indicate is that you're uh, closer to your respiratory limit. That's uh -huh. the evidence that I'm looking for, that uh -huh. you might be sick enough that you need to be seen and taken care of. Uh -huh. uh, by the way, one of the questions that came from uh, Mark was, uh, do we have enough data points to say the mortality for the COVID-19 is 3%? Yes, China has generated quite a lot of data points. And by the way, I calculated some numbers for New York this morning. They had 500 cases and like 20 deaths or something. I don't mm -hmm. remember the exact numbers right now, but the number I came up with was 3.4% in New York based on the cases mm -hmm. they have so far. However, early in these things, you always get a higher mortality rate because you notice the people who are real sick. Mm -hmm. As we get better at figuring out who has the bug, but they weren't sick enough to attract our attention, the mortality rate will fall somewhere. Um, so that's why I'm saying over and over between 1% and 3%. 3% is about the high range, 3.4% right now in New York. And 1% or a bit under is the lowest estimate I've seen. So 1% to 3 seems like a good ballpark to talk about the percent mortalities. So let's talk about – oh, go ahead. You had some more questions from the gentleman. That it doubles for folks over 60 – more than doubles, actually, quite a, quite a lot more – that it doubles again for those over 70. We'd have to go back to that graph, but it rises substantially for folks over 70. Congregations of more than how many? Right now, my university is banning congregations of more than 50 people. These are completely arbitrary numbers. We're pulling them out of the air. Hey, we're going to have two or three people meet. Toby and I got together to do this for you. Uh, on the other hand, 50 people seems like a largish crowd that's uncommon enough that you mm -hmm. could limit those without too much inconvenience to the world. So we're balancing how much we have to change our social patterns with how much, uh, you know, we have to get done and so forth. And so 50 at my school, a hundred, whatever number of people pick is an arbitrary number. The ideal number would be one. We'd all sit in little cubicles that would be sanitized. We'd communicate with each other by Skype and over the internet. And in fact, one of the spinoff, there are a lot of spinoff effects, time permitting. We should talk about that a little bit. One of the spinoff effects I'm concerned about is that we are already pretty distant from each other as a society. Mm -hmm. In fact, a surprising number of articles have been written about how difficult it is for adults to form friendships. <laughs> Because we're all busy with our families and our jobs and things like that, right? In school, it was easy. We thought we could do that the rest of our lives. It's actually not something we're good at. It's already difficult. We already don't care about each other enough. As long as that group over there suffers, I'll be all right, okay? I heard somebody in NPR within the last three days uh, talking about uh, they're not going to get their kids vaccinated because, hey, they heard that might be bad. I don't care about the herd. I care about my kid. I would say as a society, we already have autism. Mm -hmm. It's too late to worry about getting it from vaccines. We have a kind of societal autism that is tearing us apart. So that is one of the consequences. The economic consequences of this will be quite significant. America has largely moved from manufacturing to service jobs, which has had some positives to mm -hmm. it. But if we don't congregate, service jobs are going to wind up suffering. And for a lot of people, those are subsistence-level jobs that they really need to have. Also, manufacturing is suffering because China is losing a good chunk of its workforce right now. Not necessarily that they're all dying, but at least being taken out of commission for mm -hmm. a while. And so much of the manufacturing, we, the parts and things we depend on from China to continue our work over here, isn't happening at the same rate. Um, money is going to mean something different to us as a fomite, and so on. So... There will be substantial, lasting economic ramifications from this, and they will be permanent changes because, remember, this is the rule, not the exception. Okay, um, The marginalization, the excuse that some people will use this as to marginalize uh, some groups depresses me and worries me. Think about all the ways in which your society needs to change, some not bad, some pretty bad, and realize we need to get busy on that stuff mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to hear sometimes the government, uh, the administration, talking about uh, preventing people from coming in to a nation that already has uh, the virus. It, it's irrelevant at this point, right? It might help flatten the curve yeah. if we yeah. slow the rate at which new cases are brought in. Mm -hmm. It would somewhat help diminish the chance that there was a second variant of coronavirus that we had to worry about, mm -hmm. though that could certainly happen uh, domestically. Uh, I don't 
know how valuable that is. I would defer to an epidemiologist on mm -hmm. that, but it's not obviously a wrong answer. To me. Well, I, and I feel like the epidemiologists are at the stage where uh, they're, uh, those are small issues uh, in comparison to what we already know about where this virus is, is headed, whether or not you let Europeans in. It's kind of irrelevant at this point, right? The, the, the curve's going to go up. It's clearly going to get a large number of right. us. The most optimistic estimate I've seen is 20%. The most pessimistic is 80%. I personally am assuming it's going to be on the higher than the lower end, but mm -hmm. I have no special knowledge on right. that. Different people have come up with different estimates. I did want to mention that I was one of those people who back in 2007, I wrote a, a paper called The Network Paradox about exactly how you described that the intent was to bring us closer together. And the reality is it's spreading us further apart. Yeah, I mean, it's a peripheral issue, but the internet is the best tool of information there's ever been, but it turns out to also be the most potent tool right. of misinformation misinformation there's yeah. ever been. And I've asked a number of people who work in uh, computer sciences, uh, or information sciences, I should say, was it a net gain or loss? Are we smarter or dumber than before the internet? And oddly enough, none of them know of any studies that looked at that. Mm. I think that's, that's about an time. important question. So we do have a question. Could one use a spirometer to gauge yes. when one ought to seek medical intervention? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for mentioning that. So if you have access to a spirometer, you can buy them over the counter. You can buy them at any drugstore or pharmacy. One spirometer, don't hoard them. Uh, you could use that, find out what your normal numbers are now, and if that begins to drop off significantly, that would be another indication that your respiratory status is deteriorating. So uh, spirometry, which is a tube that you blow through that's used for asthmatics uh, primarily, or people with COPD to test their lung function. Oh, that's monitor what... Monitor how they're doing. I, I'm sorry. That's what I have in my yeah, okay. garage. Oximeter. And tracking your own vital signs and seeing if they begin to change significantly from your own your own baseline, uh -huh. okay? Because while we have averages, you're not average, you're you. Uh, so please advise whether we should uh, tuck in home or for how long, go to the gym, the movies, stores, thank you. I would, for the time being, limit going to places where there are groups of people as much as you reasonably can. I teach at a university. Uh, they just extended spring break by two weeks, and my guess is we're going to be doing online learning when I get back. Mm -hmm. And honestly, for me, the big reward is my students. I actually don't like the idea of not going to work and seeing my students and my coworkers, who mm -hmm. are, are just great people. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, we should probably all uh, avoid as much socializing in groups as we reasonably can. Remember that we want to flatten that curve. Eventually, this thing's going to work its way through the whole community. Those of us who are immune won't get sick. Those of us who get sick will hopefully develop immunity, and some of us will be lost. But the flatter that curve is, the better the medical system will be able to take care of us. So um, on Saturday, I've been invited by four people, one uh, to a closed indoor basketball game, uh, one to meeting at the mall for lunch, uh, one to a bike ride out on the Bosca Trail, and one to a poker game. I'd go to the bike ride and skip the others. Because the bike ride's outside, you're not sharing each other's air, things like that. Mm. Uh, I'll make a confession. A couple of days ago, when I put this together for my class, I did a special session. Unthinkingly, I said, let's gather our different classes in a classroom, and I'll tell them all about coronavirus. <laughs> See the problem? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Luckily, no, one that's of good. our admins, um, Amy, was kind enough to say, that might be that's, a bad that's plan. That's probably a bad and idea. And we wound up doing it uh, the way we're doing this. We streamed it on mm -hmm. Zoom instead of doing it in a classroom. Mm -hmm. But I mean, my instincts are... Yeah, let's get everybody together and talk yeah, about this. And yeah. they were the wrong instincts. Yeah, right? let's whiteboard this so, baby. So, you know, I'm confessing that I'm making the same mistake I'm telling everybody don't make. Right. So uh, I, I uh, after a depressing day of news, I always turn on the uh, nighttime shows called Bear and Kimmel and uh, to watch them. Yes. And it was horrendous to watch them last night because they had been informed no more audiences. Yes. So they were that. all trying to do live shows with no audiences. Yes. And it was just depressing terrible for, for them. them. Yeah. yeah. Another question. Let's see. Uh, please post a link to the printed material on the interesting conversation page. Yes. That is the point. intention. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, uh, Coffee's intent is to post it 
uh, post the presentation, which contains the links. It's a PowerPoint presentation, so you'll be able to uh, open up the presentation on your desktop and uh, link to it. Do, did you want to say something, Cheryl? Dot com. Oh, uh, interesting conversations, nm.com. All right. So that's where all this material is going to be posted, not in the uh, Facebook page. Interesting conversations, nm.com. So is I where realized you'll find this that I said earlier dot org. I meant I should have said dot com. I think I said dot org earlier. Yeah, it is dot com because I've been there. Okay. Uh, so do you want to find some slides on some preventive me measures that one could take, and then we'll go f uh, go from there? Sure. Let's see what I got here. Tell me when I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> we just got advised by someone, you and coffee, stop touching your faces. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. right. I'm gonna okay, Mark. I'm going to fold my arms here. All right, Mark. I can't get, I can't. Oh, that. okay. Hang on. Let me, uh, I'll give it to you. All right. Go find the slides. And <laughs> go ahead and go find your slides and I'll get these questions. Um Okay, this is actually the section from uh, CDC. So how hang on, hang on a sec. So let's answer this question before we uh, uh, change the screen over. So SARS dash COV dash two is a virus and is COVID dash nineteen considered a virus? Oops, yes, we do have is. a question. So hang on, this might be one of mine. Hang on, just a sec. Hey, uh, you've reached Toby and Coffee. Did you have a question for Dr. Brown? No questions for Dr. Brown at this time. All right. Uh, so we're it's, it's Josh. It's Josh Drowser. Josh, to to you're very kind. I have to let you know that we're not doing a show tonight uh, because we volunteered our studio for uh, Dr. Coffee Brown so he could talk about uh, the um, coronavirus on his own Facebook page. So uh, oh, okay. you can call back tomorrow night, all right? But I was practically uh, hypnotized what, what by time? the beauty of the sand photos. Uh, we, start, uh, we start at 7 o'clock Mountain Daylight Time uh, on A Gypsy's Kiss, all right? Have a good night. Thank you, you too. Thanks. So we do have callers that come in to her. So let me go back to that question. SARS-CoV-2 is a virus and is COVID-19 considered a virus disease because of the lasting effects? It's a virus because of its no, morphology. No, not because right? of the lasting effects. In fact, many viruses, they come, they do their thing, and they go away, and you're fine afterward, mm -hmm. colds and flus. Mm -hmm. uh, some viruses are uh, more severe, like HIV. So this is a good time to mention that, broadly speaking, bacterial diseases are more severe. They're more likely to kill you, and they progress a lot faster and a lot further, on average. But they're easier to treat because antibiotics work on them. Viral diseases, for the most part, tend to be more minor, but we can't treat them. We have minimally effective stuff for the flu, some reasonably effective stuff for shingles, and uh, some pretty darn good drugs for HIV. But uh -huh. in general, antivirals don't work for most things. So they're harder to treat, but they're not a big deal, so we just write them out. Some of the worst diseases, though, are viral, and that would include corona now, and HIV, and SARS, and MERS. Uh, polio would be a good example. So some really bad players are viral and not amenable to antibiotics. Uh, both bacteria and viruses, often we can develop vaccines for. Mm -hmm. There are some exceptions, but broadly speaking, vaccines are usually something we can develop for common bacteria and viruses. Okay. HIV is an exception so far. So uh, when I was in Vietnam, I got malaria. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went through the process of getting, uh, uh, you know, being fixed. Uh, but from that point forward, I couldn't give blood because they told me I was a carrier. Malaria is a parasitic disease, and the little parasites live inside the red blood cells. They're small enough that they look like little curled up alien fetuses inside the red blood cells. And so what they were telling you is that you still have some of those inside of your red blood cells. And if I got a transfusion from you, you might they could infect me. So is the, well, the question I had is, I, I wasn't, uh, the question I had is, 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 that, is that true of this virus? It is not thought oh, to okay. be. okay. All right. Um, now, the question of transfusion after infection wasn't directly addressed. Mm -hmm. But the notion that we think you get immunized if you get the infection 
implies that you would not have a viral load after 10 days. And remember, you're not infectious after 10 days. And this, uh, so I would predict that it would not show up in blood transfusions as long as you're out of that period. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is not a question I saw a direct evidence-based answer to. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I have one more question for you here, and then we can go to your slides. No, that was the last one. So let's go to your uh, slides. Okay. There you go. So then the question was, well, what ought we to do? And this is advice directly from the CDC page. Uh, we pay their taxes, so I think it's, you know, I think it's okay to... Uh, it's the federal government. It's right. open source. So this virus uh, spreads person to person. Uh, it's aerosolized. A distance of about six feet is considered op optimal. Six feet or more, that is to say. Uh, coughing and sneezing, so just like colds or flus. We're going to go back to screenshot, and I'm going to give control to you. All right, you're good. All right. Wash your hands often. I keep saying that, and you're like, really, don't you have anything better? There is nothing better. It's the right answer. Mm -hmm. Relative isolation, so limiting social contacts, and washing your hands are the keys to controlling this, just like they were the keys to controlling typhoid and uh, scarlet fever back in Victorian times. The basic answer isn't different now. Um. Use sanitizer, but we use hand sanitizer a lot when we're out in public and we can't get to a sink and just wash our hands. But uh, really, the key is the hand washing. Use hand sanitizer as plan B, not plan A. By the way, that should say at least 70% alcohol, according to most other sources that I saw. There's some evidence that, or some reason to believe, according to one microbiologist at least, that 70% is better than 90%. But 70 seems to be the number everybody's agreed on, 70% so, alcohol. Uh, uh, so I went to the store day before yesterday to buy some hat. Of course, everybody's out. But I do have, uh, I uh, clean my uh, CPAP device with a spray bottle of alcohol. Yeah. Can I spray my hands? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. It's a great way to go. And it's probably what I'll wind up doing. Okay. Don't touch your eyes, nose, and mouth. Like we have d during this entire program. So yeah, like we don't, don't be like us. We're, yeah. Right? Avoid we're, close contact. We're like bad we examples. All the way through. Um, if you get sick with anything, stay home. First of all, right now, today, March 13th, probably not going to be COVID. But the sicker everybody is, the sicker they'll get if they get COVID. So don't share anything, right? And if it were COVID, you'd be glad. We'd all be glad you stayed home, <laughs> right? And I certainly will, which is hard for me. I've never missed a day of work in my adult life for being ill. I now feel that that's a confession, not a bragging, right? I used to feel differently about it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm retired. I live alone. So it's easy for me not to get out. But there's a point at which you feel like the world is... You get a little stir crazy. Yeah. Take yeah. your dog out for a walk. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. All right. All, although I have to admit, uh, I've recently taken more advantage of the Walmart grocery delivery service than I have. That makes sense. And Good I for them, too. That keeps some of the service industry. Put in the door, employed. and I'll let me know when you're gone, you know. That's probably going to really pick up. I, I uh, imagine. Yeah. It will have to. Uh, so cover your nose and mouth with the tissue when you cough or sneeze. Use the inside of your elbow. Throw used tissues in the trash. I don't know why they put this here. What do other people do with their... I mean, what else would you do with them? Some people put them back in their pockets, so they think is the problem. Uh, I don't. I'm a trash guy. Okay. Throw them away. And then wash your hands. Remember, you handled that thing, so it's now covered with the stuff that was in your nose and mouth and respiratory tract, so wash your hands. Okay? If you are sick, wear a face mask. But you don't need to wear a face mask if you personally are not ill. It's not good protection from the people who are sick, but it's good protection if you're the ill one because it'll trap the stuff you're coughing and sneezing out and breathing out. Uh, although I will advise you, if you don't have a face mask, uh, already have a face mask, you're not going to find one. I basically surveyed on Saturday every possible location that I could get a face mask from the Dollar General store to Home Depot to Lowe's to Harbor Freight to what it, their, their shelves were literally empty. And so Amazon empty unless you want to buy it from some scammer that's selling you, you know, $40 Paper masks. Hoarders and scalpers have been stealing them from hospitals. Yeah, yeah. That's going to turn out to be very consequential. Um, so do what I do. Tie a bandana over your lower face when you go to the bank. Let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> uh, 
virus, virus. <laughs> so things that you touch a lot, you know, clean them up regularly. And that you can use things like bleach and pure yeah, alcohol. Yeah, for cleaning. Like that. That's uh, all fine. What did you call them? Fo- fomites. Fomites. I'm talking about fomites, okay? And then there's lots of detailed instructions here, which, uh, you know, just look at the online sources. It'd be boring to read them out loud. So do you, do you, uh, you uh, earlier in your presentation, you suggested that you had a recipe for hand sanitizer. Yeah. Is it that easy to put together? Yeah. Hold on. Okay. You're making people crazy. Go ahead. Okay. Put it right up at the front here somewhere. There you go. Isopropyl, glycerol, hydrogen peroxide, distilled water, spray bottle. Okay. That's pretty I have I have all that stuff in uh I thought it was interesting that the uh, governor of New York in announcing what they were what actions they were taking had actually put uh the uh prisons in New York to to work making hand sanitizer. To make sand sanitizer. I think we should do that. They here were in New very Mexico. impressed. We have with a themselves. lot we're a big prison state. Yeah. Uh, one of our state industries is, is uh private prison run prisons. Yeah, yeah. So that would be a good idea for us. Get them to work to hand sanitizer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're about to go an hour and a half. We don't have any more message, no other calls, except the guys that are calling. Thank you guys for helping sure. us by sending in your questions. Really appreciate that. And Help us more by spreading the word about the things we can do to protect each other. So any last recommendations you can make to the viewing audience flatten and the people the who see this? Every minute of every day, be thinking, how can I flat, help flatten that curve? Great. All right, sir. I'm not going to shake your hand because somebody <laughs> will yell at us if we do. Yeah. All right. I'll touch Th- your face. <laughs> Let's just do the Vulcan face. <laughs> Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your attention. We appreciate the questions that you sent in to us. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Coffey back as this evolves uh, to come back and maybe have some future conversations for this. And we'll spread it not only to his channel but on Facebook, but our channel on YouTube. Uh, so stick with us on the matter. Uh, I think we can all, in our own way, to con- contribute uh, to making sure this is a short-lived in the United States. Uh, and each of us has to do something. Um, so this is as good as we can do right now. All right. Again, thanks for joining us tonight. And this video will be available in about an hour and a half. It takes about an hour and a half for Facebook to process it. So if you need to come and review and remember that you'll be able to find the presentation that Dr. Coffee shared tonight with you at, uh, interesting conversations, NM dot com. Great. C O M. Sorry about saying org earlier. Right. And um, and uh, so if you need uh, uh, the information that he presented tonight, just go there to get it. All right. Thanks for joining us tonight. We appreciate it.